Hi there, my name's Keith and welcome to Keith James Green's Bible Research. Over the last number of years, I've been reading a book entitled The Blind Watchmaker. And this book was written by Richard Dawkins, who's one of the most prolific exponents of the theory of evolution in the 20th century. And I must admit that the book was really well written and I really enjoyed it and I particularly enjoyed his descriptions of complicated biological systems. Now in the book he claims that all the life forms that we see today descended from one common ancestor and those life forms he says were created by a long series of small accumulative beneficial random mutations over millions of years each mutation giving a particular creature and its offspring a greater ability to survive than its peers put simply Dawkins calls this supposed creative mechanism natural selection or the blind watchmaker now today many scientists talk about this proposed creative mechanism as though it were a fact and many non-scientists just take it for granted and they believe it's true that it's responsible for the creation of all the complicated biological life that we see today and they just think it's a fact well let me tell you that's definitely not what's called a scientific fact and the reason I say this is because the National Academy of Science defines what a scientific fact is. A scientific fact is something that has been repeatedly observed by the five senses, scientific tools or instruments. And so science actually has a more rigorous definition of what a scientific fact is. And it's easy to see why, because this definition excludes beliefs, conclusions based on interpretation and bias. And so it's a much better definition of something that is a fact. Therefore, since no one has lived for millions of years and has the opportunity to directly observe the supposed capability of this Darwinian mechanism, in science, it could only be referred to as either a hypothesis or a theory. But to be a theory, it would need to be well substantiated and tested. Otherwise, it's just a hypothesis, an idea that hasn't been proved or tested. Now, about five years ago, I decided to become more informed about this subject and to find out whether there really is evidence to support the ability of the supposed blind watchmaker. Because in Richard Stook book, he claims that this blind watchmaker has genius creative ability and has created all of the complexity that we see in biology. So I began to read his book. Now I'm not a scientist, but it really wasn't hard to see that the book really didn't contain much in the way of scientific evidence to support this idea and was more about trying to make the idea plausible and believable to the public because Richard realizes that the public is actually very skeptical especially when it looks at, looks at systems because normally when we look at a system that mankind has made, we really don't put that down to any random forces or any other thing other than intelligent design. Now, after reading the book for about five years, I came to my own conclusion. And I concluded that the claimed ingenious ability of the blind watchmaker badly lacks supportive evidence and is at best an unsupported hypothesis. Now this conclusion actually was surprisingly confirmed by Dawkins himself. 
because it was a few years before I went back over a chapter, chapter 2, page 37, where even Dawkins himself, surprisingly, after having discussed this subject as though it was a fact, said this, Our modern hypothesis is that the job was done in gradual evolutionary stages by natural selection. So here, Dawkins himself actually supports my conclusion that this idea is no more than a hypothesis. However, in his book, he sets out to try and make this idea plausible and believable to the reader because he realized it's rather counterintuitous and incredulous for people to actually believe that such complicated systems can arise without purposeful design. So did he achieve his purpose? Well, in this video, I'd like to go through a few of the chapter one and chapter two and give you some of the reasons why I personally am not convinced. And later on in further videos, I'll go through more of the book to show you what the book is about so you can make up your own mind. But I've made up my mind. I just, sorry, Richard, I just don't believe that this mechanism is capable of creating all of the genius biological systems that we see today. So we'll start off in chapter one. In chapter one, Dawkins goes to great lengths not to undervalue what he's trying to explain. He's trying to explain how complex biological systems were created and he admits it needs to be well explained and plausibly explained because actually he realizes that it appears to be designed. For example, he writes the following in chapter one and page one. He says, Biology is the study of complicated things that they give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. Further, in chapter 2, in another statement, he says the following. Animals give the appearance of having been designed by theoretically sophisticated and practically ingenious physicist or engineer. And that's chapter 2, page 36. He then further explains in chapter 2 and talks about the complex engineering problems that random mutation and natural selection, not an engineer, would have to overcome just to produce a BATS echolocation navigational system, which he describes as so ingenious that it would strike an engineer dumb with admiration. However, what can only really dis be described as his personal belief, he rules out completely the possibility that it was purposely designed and said, no, it's not. It's only an illusion. So he realized it looks very much designed and I must admit myself, it looks extremely designed, but he says, no, it's not, it's an illusion. And then he sets out in chapter two to try and convince us that this is an illusion, folks. So that's basically what he's trying to do. So in chapter two, he continues to try and convince us. And he talks about artificial selection. He said, look what artificial selection has done, how it's produced such variety in shape and size over a few hundred years. Look what's taken place. And then he states his opinion. He said, isn't it therefore reasonable to expect that random mutation and natural selection over millions of years has created ingenious, complex biological systems? He said, isn't that reasonable? Well, not to me. And what he failed to mention is also mentioned is in another book, which is entitled Explore Evolution. And this book was written by a number of scientists, which you can see on your screen. 
and they talked about artificial selection and they said that artificial selection is about sharing and mixing of pre-existing genes within a particular species of dogs or horses. It's not about the creation of new biological systems as Dawkins claims through random mutation and natural selection. It's not random mutation and natural selection. It's not mutations, it's genes that exist and the swapping and sharing. In fact, the book goes on to say that artificial selection is how species change as a result of loss of genetic information. It's not about new genetic information because all of the complicated systems that we see today take tremendous amount of coding and all of life, if you don't know, comes about as a result of coded information in the DNA. And so to create complicated systems, that is tremendous amount of information. It's like the type coding a computer program. That's how much coding would be needed to create systems. It's, and so artificial selection is about loss of information. And it's not even about mutations. It's about sharing pre-existing genes that are already there. So what's this got to do? And how's this great supportive evidence for you know, this random mutation, natural selection, and, and the ability that they attribute to it. But anyway, leaving that to one side, you really don't have to be a scientist to realize, to say that small changes in the shape and size of particular species such as dogs is convincing evidence that the blind watchmaker created new complicated biological systems. To me, that simply is to extrapolate far beyond the, um, what the empirical evidence can establish. And in my opinion, that conclusion is only what could be described as Dawkins' personal belief and the belief of many other evolutionists. But it certainly is not a scientific fact and no way is it proved. So continuing further in chapter 2, in order to try and convince us, Dawkins talks about the peppered moth. And he says, look how peppered moths became darker in colour within a hundred year period since the Industrial Revolution. Look at that, isn't that amazing, he said. He didn't say it in those words, that's my words. And then he goes on to say the reason they became the lighter coloured moths uh, changed, the population changed to more darker coloured ones, was because the lighter coloured ones were easily spotted by their predators as they rested on tree trunks. Because during the Industrial Revolution, he said the tree trunks became blackened, and so the darker moths were protected, and so therefore there was an increase in the number of darker moths. And so there was a change. Yes, he said, it is a far cry from what would be needed to create, for example, the bat echolocation navigational system or the complicated eye. However, he said, it's quite plausible because over millions of years, millions of years is longer than a hundred years. Well, once again, for me, he extrapolates way beyond empirical evidence. That's his belief. It's not my belief. But anyway, apart from that, according to what I read in the book Exploring Evolution, Dawkins fails to provide any evidence that the moths became darker as a result of any mutation that took place during that time. In fact, the book Exploring Evolution says darker moths already existed and they just became uh, greater in population. In any case, a lot of scientists today question the very experiment that took place back then and they say that these peppered moths don't fly around during the day anyway and they don't rest on tree trunks, they rest up on higher branches in the tree. And they said during that time that the people that did the experiment uh, took the moths out during the day 
And so what they observed was right normal behavior anyway. So they say that the experiment was faulty. In conclusion, for me, it's a very big leap in faith, in secular faith, to say that the accumulation of small changes in the shape of and size of dogs and the increased number of black moths constitutes good evidence that the blind watchmaker created complicated biological systems, such as the ingenious bat echolocation navigational system. Just think for a minute how many coordinated biological nuts, bolts and parts have to be assembled with the proviso that each part needs to increase the ability of the creature to survive better than its peers because that is what is required by this Darwinian mechanism. A good analogy to illustrate what I'm trying to say is you just imagine the assembly of a sonar navigational system in a submarine. Imagine such a system being put together part by part, bit by bit, with the proviso that each part needs to give the submarine some sort of operational advantage. Some sort of advantage, even though the assembly of such a system part by part means that the system doesn't exist until everything's put together. So it just, for me, it's not really practical. The idea doesn't really make sense. Yet that's what evolutionists would have us believe, that biological systems were created bit by bit over millions of years, each part giving some sort of advantage, some imagined advantage to the creature. Sorry, for me, it just makes no sense. Dawkins' book greatly lacks empirical evidence and my conclusion is that it's little more than speculation and wishful thinking. Well, that's all for now. In the next video, I will be further revising Dawkins' book and you can make up your own mind. I've made up mind. Until then, goodbye from Keith James Green's Bible Research.